All right, so we're going to start off with modified barium swallow, MBS. The modified barium swallow x-ray procedure that obtains viewing of swallowing function. So it's actually the function of uh, <clears throat> swallowing that barium. It's recorded on videotape. So it's useful in determining presence or absence of aspirated material. So if it aspirates into the airway, if the epiglottis doesn't close, lets the uh, whatever they're eating or swallowing go into the airway, then they're going to stop <clears throat> any more imaging. And uh, this is usually done by speech uh, within the hospital. Okay, <clears throat> so small amounts of different textured, uh, sometimes flavored barium are swallowed. So they'll start with like maybe some thin, and then it'll get a little bit thicker and thicker as you go along to see what they can um, easily swallow. Um, easily eat and what's not being aspirated. Okay, so um, sometimes it doesn't uh, taste the best, but this is uh, definitely a uh, function test to make sure that they're able to swallow and not aspirating anything. Uh, provides information to speech pathology, speech uh, therapy, basically. Uh, evaluates the mechani mechanical aspects of this of swallowing what materials uh, can move through when they're swallowed um, <clears throat> the MBS is complete when the patient fully alert and is painless um, so it's you can't have a patient that's sleeping you got to have somebody that's awake and listening to the commands um, usually takes less than 10 minutes to complete um, you can see here that uh, this is um, a speech therapist, this is the radiologist, and this is the patient here. So the speech therapist will feed the patient while uh, the radiologist is uh, using floral and recording the patient swallowing, and then that's all documented in the patient's chart. Uh, so biliary, <clears throat> so our bile route, know your bile route, okay? So right and left hepatic duct to the common hepatic duct to the common bile duct to the pancreatic duct and into the duodenum, okay? So make sure that you review this so you know. Uh, operative cholangiogram, so this is your operative cholangiogram. It's got listed here what we're looking at A through E. So just know these, know where they converge, know what they uh, form into. So like the right and left hepatic duct form into the common hepatic duct and then the common hepatic duct becomes the common bile duct and then it finally dumps into the duodenum okay operative cholangiogram uh, purpose is for undetected chole choleoliths so know what these are right here okay uh, patency of the biliary ducts functional status of hepatopancreatic ampulla and then small lesion or lesions or strictures in the biliary ducts make sure that you know what this word is uh, look it up review it so criteria summary for an operative cholangiogram, <clears throat> you want to see the entire biliary ducts demonstrated. No motion, optimal exposure factors. This is usually done uh, in the OR with a C arm. Okay, so not necessarily done in the department anymore. Um, laparoscopic uh, cholangiogram procedure is an endoscope is inserted into the um, through the umbilicus to perform. Uh, cholecystectomy and a choleangiography. Advantages, less invasive procedure, less hospital time. It can be performed as outpatients and it's a reduced cost. So laparoscopic cholangiogram. T-tube cholangiogram prefer, uh, performed in the radiology department, which that not necessarily true anymore. Um, sometimes they're done in OR. Um, very rarely done in the department unless it's a special procedure um, that's been ordered. So the T-tube is placed in the common bile duct during surgery, extending outside the body and then clamped off. And then they come to the department and they're going to introduce contrast media injected into the T-tube catheter. And then you're going to do imaging to see where that contrast material is. A lot of times when they do this, they just go ahead and do it in the OR uh, before the patient even wakes up. But. <clears throat> ERCP, okay? 
Endoscopic retrograde cholangiopanctiography. The procedure is an endoscope inspection, cannulation, and injection of the biliary ducts using a duodenoscope. Okay, so this is going to go down uh, into the stomach, and then they're going to go to the duodenum. Okay, so <clears throat> um, the patient is put under for this, and they usually use a C arm. Uh, to follow and find the end of the endoscope uh, for the imaging. Urologic studies. Urinary system. Two kidneys, two ureters, a urinary bladder, and a urethra. Suprarenal adrenal glands. <clears throat> uh, endocrine system. Okay, So suprarenal adrenal glands are part of the endocrine system. <clears throat> This is an anterior view of your kidneys, and your adrenals sit on top of the kidneys. Your ureters come down and enter into the bladder and then out the urethra during voiding. Urography and contrast media. So radiographic exam of the urinary system injected intravenously. Uh, they've had a venipuncture or possible that you may have to do the venipuncture, or it's done retrograde through a catheter, which... Um, Either a urologist will do, uh, maybe a radiologist will do it as well, just depending on where you're at and what the procedure is calling for. Um, it says here ionic oil-based or non-ionic water-soluble. Uh, usually anymore, they don't use the oil-based. Um, it's usually just the non-ionic water-soluble. So we are moving away from uh, the oil-based uh, contrast medium. So patient's history per patient's chart. So know your creatinine levels, okay? So know the normal creatinine, know the normal bun, know the normal glucophage, metformin, uh, what it's for, taken for non-insulin dependent diabetes, and it should be withheld for 48 hours prior to the procedure, and then sometimes it may have to be withheld after the procedure, uh, but just follow the protocol where you're at. But do know um, your elevated or your creatinine levels and your bun levels, okay? So excretory urography, IVU, intravenous ur uh, urogram, uh, looks at the entire urinary system, so the kidneys, ureters, down to the bladder. Uh, excretory is going to visualize the bladder through the urethra and uh, voiding. The purpose is to visualize the collecting portion of the urinary system, assess the functionality, functional ability of the kidneys. It is a timed procedure, and it may be imaged all the way until the patient um, voids. Okay. So contraindications for an IVU, know these contraindications for an IVU just in case they come up. Okay, so review this. Uh, hypersensitivity to contrast, anuria, multiple myeloma, diabetes, especially diabetes mellitus, uh, severe hepatic or renal disease, congestive heart failure, uh, pheochromocytoma, uh, sickle cell anemia, patients taking glucophage, Okay, so make sure that you do a really good history and then renal failure. So your history becomes important so you can uh, catch these contraindications before proceeding. IVU, basic routine, a scout radiograph. You're going to inject the <clears throat> contrast. Note the time of the beginning of the contrast. So exact timing is important. You don't want to guesstimate. You want to know the time. Filming routine, one minute. Uh, nephrogram or nephrotomogram. Uh, five minutes, AP supine. 15 minutes, AP supine. And then 20 minutes, posterior obliques, and then a post void prone or erect. So then they're going to go ahead and void, and then you're going to do your post void. Okay, so once again, make sure um, timing is important okay so make sure that you are aware is it a time study is it not a time study before you continue okay so criteria summary ap ivu you want to entire the uh you want the entire urinary system demonstrated no rotation no motion appropriate technical factors and minute markers visible so you're either going to put the minute markers on there or you're going to post annotate them. Normally, they're post annotated uh, typed on there. Just make sure that you're very specific with the time. Okay. 
So criteria summary for a nephrotomogram. The entire renal parenchyma is visualized. So the entire kidney is visualized. Uh, appropriate technique employed, specific level markers visible. And the level markers are with the nephrotomogram, at what level are you doing your slices? So make sure that you note that. So is it at eight centimeters or seven centimeters or six centimeters where those slices are being taken? So criteria for posterior obliques, you want the elevated side kidney is parallel to the plane of the film, okay? So this is the elevated side, which you can see parallel with the film. The downside ureter is free of superimposition. So you're looking at the downside ureter, the upside kidney, okay? Upside and downside, okay? So the entire urinary system is visualized. You can see the entire uh, bladder down here. So you're going to do one and then do the other because you're only seeing one kidney and one ureter. So the opposite oblique will show the other kidney and the other ureter. And then uh, make sure that you have uh, minute markers either visible or uh, post annotated to the image. Uh, criteria for AP erect post void, the entire system. So you can see the, the diaphragm up here, okay? <clears throat> and then you are seeing the rest of the, uh, the, the bladders or the, the kidneys. You'll be able to see the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder. This is post void, so you may not have um, contrast material there. But you want to make sure that everything is included. Uh, retrograde urography AP is a modified lithotomy position, central ray at the level of the iliac crest. Okay, so this is retrograde. Uh, the patient a lot of times is put under. They'll go into the urethra and they're going to retrograde up through the ureters into the kidney um, <clears throat> to visualize it with contrast. So criteria for the summary of the retrograde, you'll always do a scout to make sure that you're well positioned. Then you're going to do they're going to go in, find the ureter. They're going to introduce contrast up the ureter. You're going to take an image. Then they'll go and they'll do the other side if necessary. Otherwise, they'll visualize that one, and then they may put in um, a... Uh, so this is showing the catheter withdrawn, but they may put in a stent from the kidney to the bladder, just depending on what's going on. But that's what you're doing. The left pilogram, left catheter is in place. You can see it down here. Contrast is inserted. They take the catheter out, and then you take another picture with the catheter withdrawn. <clears throat> so cystogram, central ray two inches superior to the symphysis pubis. Okay, so an AP 10 to 15 degrees caudad. So 10 to 15 degrees caudad. Posterior obliques, 45 to 60 degree oblique. So it's not your normal 45, it is a 45 to 60. Okay, so your cystogram, a true lateral, central ray two inches superior and posterior to the symphysis pubis. Okay, so it is, um, you find the pubis symphysis, which is at the greater trochanter. So you are, um, two inches superior to that, and then two inches uh, posterior to it for your central ray, okay? <clears throat> your criteria for your cystogram, urinary bladder not superimposed by the pubic bone, and that's why there is that um, caudad angle on it. Posterior obliques, the urinary bladder is not superimposed by lower limbs. Distal ureter bladder and proximal urethra on male is to be included. So on the male patient, you want to make sure that you include the entire uh, urethra. And you can see the urethra coming down here, so you want to make sure that that's all included, the entire bladder and the urethra. Uh, avoiding cystourethrogram, VCUG, uh, technical positioning uh, 10 by 12 lengthwise, uh, 70 to 75 kvp. You're going to use a grid. Central ray is perpendicular to the symphysis pubis. So female patient AP uh, can either be supine or erect, extend and slightly separate the legs. Okay. So a lot of times it's easier um, supine than erect. 
and then with the bladder full, then they're just going to urinate. So move that contrast out through uh, the urethra so they, you can see the functionality of the entire urethra. A male is recumbent at a 30 degree RPO. It superimposes the urethra over the right thigh. So this allows you to visualize the entire urethra okay, in this RPO position. So just remember that females are supine and males are that 30 degree RPO. <clears throat> Arthrography studies. Uh, Arthrograph contrast media study of the synovial joints, related soft tissue. So common joint study, hip, knee, ankle, shoulder, elbow, wrist, TMJs. Uh, this is not done a lot. Uh, usually you are looking at um, knees and shoulders a lot. Sometimes you'll get the occasional wrist or a hip. So you're introducing contrast into the synovial joints and visualizing it. Sometimes they'll go to CT or MRI after the introduction of this contrast. Okay. So arthrography equipment, you need the fluoroscopy, the fluor fluoroscopy room, uh, you'll have some conventional x-ray maybe that you have to do and then your arthrogram tray. So make sure that you know how to set up your arthrogram trays. Um, it is a sterile environment, so know how to set them up in a sterile, uh, for a sterile field. Uh, entire articular uh, capsule is outlined, so if you're taking images with uh, the contrast material, make sure that you include all of the, uh, the joint uh, make sure you're getting all of the contrast, okay? Make sure your markers are visible. A lot of times it's just an AP and a lateral, but it all depends on what the protocol is where you're working, okay? So shoulder arthrography demonstrates the soft tissue structures. It's a single or a double contrast, uh, 12 cc's of positive, uh, 10 to 12 cc's of positive contrast, 10 to 12 cc's of negative contrast, and then fluoroscopy is used to guide the needle for placement, and you may take um, images afterwards. You may have to take a scalp before, or they may just use the fluoroscopy to uh, visualize the shoulder, uh, insert the needle in the contrast, and then take images uh, with the fluoroscopy unit um, and turn those in instead of regular still films. And you can see here the shoulder arthrogram. Uh, scout AP projection if needed, internal and external rotation if needed or done under uh, fluoro. Uh, the glenoid cavity AP obliques if necessary uh, done by either um, images or fluoro images captured, inferior, superior, axial, lateral, or intratubecular groove. If these are needed, um, those are going to be done after. They're not going to be done with the floral unit. Knee arthrogram assesses the knee joint, associated soft tissue, joint capsule, meniscus, and the ligaments. Okay, So that's what you're trying to visualize. You may take still films and then more than likely they're either going to go to CT or MRI to get the rest of the imaging. So knee arthrogram indications tears in the joint capsule tears or degeneration of the menisci, which is common, ligament injury, which is common. Contraindications are going to be those uh, hypersensitivity to iodine or local anesthetics. Sometimes you get those patients, but um, that is going to be uh, figured out through a really good history that you're going to take. And then they're going to have to fill out some informed consent forms. Either a nurse will do that before it may fall on you to get that informed consent. Just make sure that you know what you're doing. Uh, Mylogram tray and large positioning sponge and compact pillow. This is what you're going to need just for positioning your patient and making them comfortable. Uh, the sponges are going to help hold the patient in position and then the pillow is going to give them support for their head uh, during the mylogram. <clears throat> the mylogram tray is another sterile tray so make sure uh, you know that, know how to set it up, and can um, set up a sterile tray without um, making it non-sterile, basically. So the patient room, uh, they may have some pre-medication. They'll have some informed consent. You're going to be in the floral room. 
Uh, make sure that the table can tilt because they may need to tilt the table. Know where your shoulder braces are and your ankle restraints and, restraints, and you may have them already attached to the table because the protocol may call for it, okay? Myelogram, needle placement, and injection process. So the skin's going to be prepped. Either you will do that or the radiologist will. The lumbar puncture, the patient will be prone or left lateral position, just depending on what the radiologist is comfortable with. And then they're going to pull um, cerebral spinal fluid will be collected. So know how to collect it, know how to take care of it so it stays sterile and can get to the lab. Contrast media will be instilled sometimes. Um, depending on what's going on. Sometimes you'll just pull spinal fluid. Sometimes you'll pull spinal fluid, introduce contrast media. Um, the needle will be removed. Um, you may tilt the table um, towards the head. So Trendelenburg to get the uh, contrast material to flow. You may have to take a cross table C-spine to make sure that you have uh, contrast there and then they will more than likely go to uh, say like CT or MRI depending on what's being done and what's being uh, put in. Myelogram, a cervical puncture, um, erect around C1, C2 level. Your lumbar puncture is level 3, 4, L-spine 3 and 4, uh, done prone or left lateral, sometimes erect. Um, but not very often. Um, a lot of times, even the C-spine, it's not that they just do a C-spine anymore. If anything, they're going to do a, uh, a complete myelogram. So you'll have contrast in the L-spine, T-spine, C-spine sort of thing. But know that they can do just a cervical uh, puncture, uh, and that'll be at C1 and 2, the level of C1 or 2. Uh, myelogram, contrast material, ionic or non-ionic, uh, water-soluble, iodinated based versus oil-based, where most everything is the, uh, is the water-soluble iodine, um, not the oil-based anymore. Um, it has, a, say, around a one-hour radiopacity, so that's why right after they get done, then they're going to go over, um, CT will be ready for them, and then they'll have their CT scan. Uh, to visualize everything. Um, spot imaging, you may have to tilt the table. Um, they may spot in different positions. Um, LPO position and AP, LPO is what they're showing here. And they're just seeing where the contrast is, how it's flowing, what does it look like, um, where is it positioned before they go uh, to CT. So cervical myelogram positioning, uh, trans uh, cervical lateral is the image that's being taken here, horizontal central ray to C5. And all they're doing is making sure that there's contrast material in the C spine. Okay, So you may have to do a swimmers on them depending on the type of patient that they are. So a swimmers lateral. Um, you may not have to do it on all of them, but it may be part of the protocol to do um, a lateral C spine and a swimmers for uh, the contrast. Um, thoracic myelogram positioning routine uh, is a right lateral decubitus, a left lateral decubitus, and a right or left lateral. Okay, So your horizontal central ray to T7, so just like a chest, you're going to set up to T7. And uh, this is not common that I know of anymore. Um, just depending on where you work, they may do thoracic myelograms. They may do um, still films like this. Most of the time, they just check them under floral and then send them off to uh, CT. So left lateral is what they're showing here. Um, and then you're doing a right or left uh, lateral uh, T-spine. Still, everything central ray to T7 because that's our uh, centering for our thoracic spine. Okay, so this is the lumbar myelogram positioning semi erect transabdominal lateral. So you're focusing on just the L spine and you're just shooting a cross table. They have the patient in the um, Fowler position just to keep the contrast in the lumbar spine. So the tube is turned to match the cassette. So the cassette's running down, the tube's running down, so they match. Horizontal central ray to L3, 
uh, column eight, uh, you may have to do anterior obliques. So you may have to do like um, RAO, LAO, and then you may have to do uh, imaging PA or AP depending on the patient. Okay. So criteria summary for the lumbar myelogram, you want appropriate level of uh, central ray, and then you want to make sure that you have contrast medium in the image that you can see uh, optimal exposure factors. Make sure that you have your patient uh, marker, your, your uh, right or left marker on there, and then collimation is evident. So you're really looking at the spinal canal. It not, it's not necessarily... Uh, it's not necessary to have the entire vertebral bodies. If you clip them, it's not that big a deal. They're looking for that contrast material. So criteria summary for cervical myelogram. This is a transcervical lateral, and then this is a swimmer's lateral, okay? So you want the appropriate level of, of contrast material. You want to be centered at that uh, C4 uh, patient ID and markers, so you want to make sure that you have your markers on there and a well-positioned patient while you're doing this, okay? Um, you want to see that contrast material in the spinal canal after you make that image. <clears throat> Veinography, radiographic demonstration of the veins of the body. Uh, phlebography and veinography, okay? So <clears throat> this is stuff that is normally done in IR, uh, in an operating room, not something that you're going to do in a normal daily work environment um, in the radiology department, okay? So lower extremity, uh, you still need to know this though, so don't think that you can skip it. You, two major veins, the femoral vein and the popliteal vein, so those are in your lower extremity, the two major veins, okay? <clears throat> Indications of a veinography, diagnosis of thrombosis or occlusion. So that's when they're going to run to IR. Determination of vessel damage and trauma is what you're trying to do. Um, and then rule out deep vein thrombosis is what you're also trying to do. So the contrast material is going to show you the veins that are good, the veins that are clear, and that's really what you're looking for. So contraindication, sensitivity to the contrast media as always. And then at risk, patients who would not tolerate therapy upon diagnosis of a deep vein thrombosis. So if the patient won't tolerate the therapy, um, that's another contraindication that they may not do the, the, study in as, the study as well. So contrast media, water soluble, iodinated contrast, uh, physician's choice to use ionic or non-ionic. Uh, and then amount of injection determined by the anatomy of interest. So depending on where you're starting, where you're wanting to go, depending on how big the veins are, what all is necessary to visualize, that's going to determine the amount of injection. Uh, procedure, CM introduced via catheter. So catheter um, introduced into the peripheral veins, such as the femoral vein, and then move to the region of interest. So a lot of times they'll go into the femoral vein, and then they can go all the way up um, quite a ways into the body, and then introduce contrast. Um, CM introduced via direct injection, so a butterfly or uh, angiocath will flow contrast material into the region of interest. So just depends on what you're using, either a catheter or a direct injection um, into a vein, um, depending on what the patient can stand, how quick they want it to happen, um, how soon they're wanting to view the contrast material. Uh, upper extremity is usually a butterfly needle or angiocath can be placed into a peripheral vein. Entire upper extremity is imaged using this the using serial imaging, so um, sequence of images. Uh, tourniquets are applied at top or upper extremity to force the contrast material uh, in into the deep veins. Um, tourniquets released for a portion of the filming. So once again, like I said, this is mostly all done in your cath lab. So if it's something that you're interested in, uh, make sure that you let people know wherever you're working, if you're working in a hospital, that cath lab uh, interests you, uh, you wouldn't mind seeing it once in a while, or cross-training, or helping. 
something like that. Um, you kind of have to put the word out yourself. Normal upper extremity venogram, you can see the uh, basilic vein, the cephalic vein, the subclavian vein. When you're doing cath lab, you need to know your veins, okay? SVC can be filled via bilateral IV lines into median cuboidal veins, and then femoral approach can also be used. So your SVC, superior vena cava, um, sometimes you're needing to image that, so maybe it's done either bilateral um, IV lines with a big flush or the femoral approach with um, lots of contrast medium. Uh, inferior vena cava uh, pelvis imaging. Uh, similar approach for the upper anatomy, median cuboidal approach, femoral approach. So you can come up through the femoral lines, introduce that contrast, and then image it as it flows. <clears throat> Lower extremity imaging, CM contrast media administered via superficial vein on the dorsum of the foot. Yep, ouch. So tourniquets are utilized to, utilized to force the contrast material into deep vein, venous systems, okay? So um, you're wanting that contrast material to stay there and not be washed out with the normal movement of blood. So tilting of the table can be used also to distend veins and assist with poor filling of vessels. Uh, box or support may be placed under the foot or leg not being imaged, okay? So... Um, a lot of stuff that you'll learn if you go to cath lab, but keep in mind if you go to cath lab, you need to know your veins and arteries. Um, LE imaging, patient is semi-erect, um, so lower leg imaging, patient is semi-erect, contrast media is injected through the vessel in the foot, imaging is performed from the top, uh, from the foot up to the IVC, uh, pelvis or lower abdomen. So the imaging is going to go from the foot up the leg to the knee and then maybe to uh, the pelvis. Okay, So that's the way the imaging is going to be because you're introducing contrast here so it's going to flow up the patient. Okay, So keep in mind how you're going to have to image. <clears throat> lower extremity venogram um, this is what it looks like. This is what you're looking at at an anterior view and a posterior view. Lots of veins and arteries, lots of things to have to remember. Um, if you like cath lab, go for it. Uh, equipment, uh, floral room, catheters, needles, contrast material, sterile trays for the femoral approach, a filming system, stepping table or stepping C-arm system, tilting table. A lot of times you're using... Um, a C-arm uh, attached at the ceiling. The table here can tilt, lay flat, tilt this way, and then you're going to be imaging with that C-arm for the patient. Okay. All the while, um, making sure you have catheters and needles for the radiologist or the physician that's there, contrast media, making sure that you have your sterile tray and everything that's necessary, uh, being able to film, being able to work the table, uh, being able to keep track of everything that's going on around you. So positioning, depend upon anatomy, being imaged, usually single plane imaging, biplane imaging will reduce amount of contrast delivered for large veins such as the SVC or IVC. So just depending on what you have access to wherever you're at, um, single plane imaging is cheaper, but some of your better hospitals will have biplane imaging, um, better imaging of the patient for the patient, less um, contrast material needed. Um, LEU venogram angioplasty. Okay, so <clears throat> this is your uh, venogram and your angioplasty um, trying to either clean out veins or make sure that veins are clear. Uh, special exams. <clears throat> bone development. So um, bone age series. You may do hands for a bone age. Uh, you may do a pelvis uh, for growth. Um, so the epiphysis and the diaphysis will be looked at. Um, all of the uh, hand 
imaging will be compared uh, either right and left or they will be compared to other images of a child of the same age with normal bone development. Ossification of the knee, you can see here from a one-year-old to a 12-year-old, the difference in the um, the, the width and the size of the knee and the epiphyseal plate uh, finally getting to where it's going to form together. Uh, bone age studies compares patients chronological age with their bone age. Okay, So it's used for advanced or delayed skeletal maturation or development. So a lot of times you have a kid that comes in that needs a bone age. You're going to image um, either both hands and wrists in an image um, and then those are going to be compared uh, from their chronological age to their bone age to determine if they're maturing at um, an appropriate rate. An advanced or delayed bone age does not always indicate disease or pathologic growth. Okay, So <clears throat> Grulick and Pyle, an atlas of standards for comparison of radiographs for bone age. So this is what they compare them to. Um, to make sure that they're growing at an appropriate rate, okay? Radiographs taken PA left hand and wrist or AP left knee, um, that would be ages one to two. So left hand is um, probably uh, above two years of age and anything that is um, one to two will be uh, knees. Usually it's not just the left hand, it is the left and the right hand is what I'm familiar with. Um, so the knees might also be left and uh, right knee as well. But just know your protocol. Uh, include both on children under the, under the age of two years. Okay. So orthoretinography, pathological indications, back pain due to leg length difference, developmental anomalies, uh, epiphysitis, surgical procedure to shorten the limb, and then bone length surgery. Remember this oral orthoretinography, it's got the tape measure um, next to the table, so you're imaging the patient, and uh, measurements can be taken to see if they are um, of a length, appropriate length for their age, okay? So procedures, three exposures per IR, so here is the hip, the knee, the ankle, okay, and those are, this tape here is not moved during the imaging, so they know where this is and how long this should be and what the numbers should correspond to, okay, so the mat uh, metallic ruler is beside the limb during the imaging. Lower limb measurements, AP hip, AP knee, AP ankle, ruler beside the limb, no movement whatsoever, so they're going to have to hold really, really still. Central ray to the head of the femur. Um, you're going to move the cassette to the center of the knee. Uh, no central ray angle. So you're not going to angle your zero degrees. So zero degree hip, zero degree knee, zero degree ankle. Okay. Uh, once again, zero degree, central ray to the ankle joint, zero degrees. <clears throat> AP shoulder, AP elbow, AP wrist, central ray to the shoulder joint, they are all zero degrees, okay? And uh, just uh, the three images, so shoulder, elbow, and wrist, just like your lower leg, okay? And then these are the orthoretinography radiographs. Um, when they were doing these a lot, um, it won't be this way with digital, but when it was this way with um, film, they would do three images on one film. Um, now you're just going to do three separate images on your distal or on your digital cassette. Okay. So that is the end of that. Good luck. I know you've got this continue to study, you will do great.